Walking into the living room I find Royster, the original Belfast rapper, and once self-proclaimed, dirtcore daddy and queen of the scene, slouched on a brown leather couch. He's wearing an old grey bathrobe, from which a large belly protrudes, his beard streaked with grey. His once shaven head, now showing the male pattern baldness he has inherited from his father. I've been sent on an assignment from my publisher to interview him. To find out what happened to him since we last heard his voice, echoing through the halls of depravity. Having abandoned his holy buck fast, a drink he honored, in an early song called The Monk's Finest, and drunk like it was going out of fashion. He now drinks a gin and tonic from a pint glass, claiming that it matches the feeling he holds inside. That of an old woman. Having shunned marijuana for years, as documented in his classic song Not the Dope Man, a large joint now burns, between his fingers. The year is 2023, it has been 11 years since his retirement from a 10-year musical career, when he was age 33, in the year 2012. A move he carefully constructed, to coincide with the age Jesus died and the ending of the Mayan calendar. In the convening years between his retirement and now, Roy's day embarked on a spiritual journey. Quitting the drink and decadence for green tea and meditation. In the process he shed his beer belly and hypochondria. One of which seems to have returned. With a new lease on life he dived headfirst into the world of new age spirituality. Morphing from a boo swigging punk rocker, into a magic mushroom eating hippie. Today I find him at the end of that journey, wondering what comes next. His physical and mental well-being, having taken a beating at the hands of the alchemical change. He seems distant and barely aware, he looks haggard and tired. Although, he could just be both drunk and stoned. The TV to his right sits frozen on a playlist. He lifts a remote control and clicks a button. The TV wakes from sleep mode. I commence the interview, by asking him. So, how did all this begin? He stands. And starts to sing. It started with silence. Not a sound.
when their story had been written. In the silence they sat. Then it would come in. And next time they met. He says to me, for this story to be understood, he must tell it like a fairy tale. A dark fairy tale. And that I must remember, the difference between actor and character. I tell him fine, and that I recognize three main characters in the song he had just sung to me. Those being the devil, death, and the angel. With a minor appearance of the angel's mother being mentioned. I say that I noticed he said the angel had been known as Cora and Persephone. A reference to the Greek myth? He confirms saying that all the stories have already been told, but it's up to the artists to tell them in their own way. I take it you're playing the character of Hades then? I ask. He confirms, saying, yes indeed, he is the devil in this story. But a different version, than most people are used to. He tells me, I had to be taken away from death, as death was killing me. But I love death dearly, and it is just in death's nature to kill. But not until three songs from now, do we actually part ways. Here, the seed had just been first sown for that departure. I ask. So who or what is death? He answers that death was his fear of dying, personified in his lifelong hypochondria. I ask. And the angel? He says that she represents the impetus for change. I ask. So what was the catalyst for that change? He tells me, his own death. And nine months later, in the mouth of Mars Under Neptune watch to fish Let the shark They took the devil away Through an early week For that day the devil didn't die Each 30 weeks He smoked so many days so much food No one day he woke up and his blood could not move And that my kind of heart had struck He was rather sick Now all he had to do was Die like his father did Die like his father did I like his father did Oh, a comfortable ending To a life in hell Now heaven awaits The fallen ill A comfortable ending He explains that he woke up one morning and his blood had frozen in his body, it had stopped moving. This was a gift the angel had given him when they first met. He made his way to the Lagan Valley Hospital, where he was immediately admitted and given emergency treatment. Unfortunately, he died in the hospital ward that night. He tells me he had no experience of an afterlife, or coming out of his body. Saying that it was just like falling into a deep dreamless sleep, and awaking again. I say. So you woke up again? He tells me he woke in the same hospital bed the next morning, but he was not the same person he had been when he had been admitted. The world around him was familiar, but different. He pulled out the tubes and wires from his body and walked out of the Lagan Valley Hospital, in his hospital gown, rear end on display, for all of Lisbon City to see. This person he was now didn't drink or smoke. 
He wondered what on earth he would do with his life. He tells me he could now sense the world talking to him, giving him messages through music books and art. I ask him, what was the first message he received? He was told he was to seek out a lady, who would help him navigate this new life and show him the hidden mysteries of it. This lady was known as the seer. Ay, 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 ay. found the seer, she showed him how he would finally be rid of death. She told him that death was not a part of his new life, and its lingering ghost must be removed. She taught him the banishing ritual of truth. A magical working that would separate him from death, as in, his fear of it, for the rest of his days. At first he rejected it. Citing, was it not the anxiety of death, the worry that we don't have enough time, that produces such great art? She responded by asking him. Do you want to be a starving artist forever? He replied saying, I suppose I don't. So that night, he went home, and performed the banishing ritual of truth. That darkness fears itself. Suffering. Now let me explain that meaning of what's being said. See, the devil had to do the one thing he never wanted to. That was to tell death That their contract had expired And tears were shed that day As the serpent song did play Life goes on No. 
now between me and you and that was the hardest thing the devil ever had to do for he had loved death with all his heart but they were no longer what they had been at the start and so they'll pack the bags then the white horse came but to this very To his surprise, the ritual worked. One morning he awoke and the presence of death was no longer there. He felt that his life had completely changed, but in a very subtle, interior way. He says, I may not believe what he is going to tell me next. But that from here on, his life felt like he was living inside a story. He remarks that that morning he walked into his living room and all the furniture had been rearranged. But he had no memory of doing it. And from here the story, becomes a fairy tale. He said that he started to go into involuntary trances. That his inner world opened up, and behind the darkness of his eyelids, he could see it. One day, he tells me he had an appointment with the seer. Up in Opal Bay. Afterwards, he fancied a walk. And stumbled upon a forest, he had never ventured into before. A sign sat before him, simply stating. The forest. He told me he walked about the forest until nightfall, but by that time it was too dark, to find his way out. Echoing through the night, he heard a drum, beating in the distance. He followed its sound to a small hut, hidden amongst foliage. Entering the hut, he found it lit with dim candlelight. The shadow of a woman, playing a drum, and singing in a way he had never heard before, danced upon the walls. Instinctively, something inside him, told him that this lady, was known as the Dark Mother.
find my lost self here And who do I think I am? Where the hell could you be? All the rest of beauty See, all is fine He recounts that as his eyes adjusted to the darkness of the hut, he could make out the dark mother more clearly. She wore a black veil over her head. As he tried to distinguish her face, he says, her features morphed between those of a giggling young girl and a crying old lady. He tells me that he became totally entranced, and she beckoned him towards her. Climbing on top of him, they entered into the act of lovemaking. At the point of orgasm, she squeezed him so tight, it was like they merged as one. And he was suddenly somewhere else. Looking around him, it seemed he was in a vast underground cavern, that stretched for miles above his head. The walls were carved with strange symbols. She told him what he was looking at was, the language of the underworld. A language, she told him, he would one day, make into art. He pulls out a folder and shows me hundreds of pages of this language of the underworld he has created. He explains it, seeming like, being in two places at once. One version of him was frozen at the point of orgasm with the dark mother, in her hut. Another version of him, was in the underworld with her. But he was experiencing them simultaneously. She told him he would remain in this split state, permanently, if he did not discover the way out of the underworld. He says he asked her, if she could not just tell him? But she told him she could only give him a clue. And that clue was one word. Truth. Entangled in her body, I drank her golden sweat. The river broke the dam, a shame you can regret. In the Light of the morning, her breath upon my neck. I've done what I have always known, and that was to reject. At this point he tells me, he was struck with a fear. The thought of being stuck here forever, terrified him. He looked to the strange symbolic writing carved on the walls. Slowly it dawned on him. This was his own, subconscious underworld. And the writing was describing all the horrible emotions and events he had experienced, but buried, throughout his life. Here they were written for him to decode. He says he looked closer at the writing, and slowly, it started to transform into various scenes of his life. He saw himself after his first pet died, bottling up the sadness. He saw himself at the funeral of his best friend, holding back the tears. He saw himself unconscious, a man taking advantage of him. He saw himself running to the choked pleads for help, coming from his dying father in the hallway, one Monday morning. That was it. Not the last one, but the one before. That was when he changed. He had always known it had happened. The party, blacking out, waking up naked in bed with a man he didn't agree to go to bed with. How could he? He had been drugged. Now it was like he was, watching the event from the corner of the room, where it had happened. He had never fully integrated this, he just tried to forget about it, and pretended it never happened. Quickly dressing, jumping in a taxi, trying to put two and two together. 
but only remembering passing out on the stairs the night before. But now he was brought back to it all. He saw that what happened that night, had changed him. Like a part of his self, had been taken. He tells me he turned to the dark mother at that moment, and said to her. I think I was hashtag me too. He says she just smiled and hugged him. Now the underworld crumbled around them. The dark cavernous realm gave way to the forest again, where he had first stumbled across the dark mother's hut. But she was no longer there. Nor was her hut. The forest was now bright. Birds sung from trees, and sunshine shone through the branches. He says that he felt lighter inside himself, happier, like a weight had been removed from his shoulders. He can't remember how long he just sat amongst the forest, smelling the air. It could have been minutes, or hours. He says, he realized he had to find his way out of there. To find his way home. On his wanderings, he reached into his pocket and realized there was a small package there. Removing it, he saw there was a note written on it, that read. A gift from the Dark Mother. XXX. Unwrapping the package, he saw that it contained a handful of what looked like truffles. Already feeling hungry, he immediately ate them all, not knowing that they were, in fact, magical truffles. He describes his trip as so mind-blowing, no words are sufficient to describe what he experienced. On coming down, he realized at some point he had stripped naked and blindfolded himself, with his underwear. He says it took a while to gather his bearings again, time now seemed strange. Somehow different, from before he tried to find his way out, of the forest. Which now seemed even more beautiful than it had, previously. Walking, he says he came to a clearing, a large green field. In the distance, right in the middle of the field, he could see an object. As he approached it, he realized it was a large painting on an easel. Getting closer, he saw it was a portrait of a woman. He was hypnotized by the painting. Something about the woman entranced him. How she was painted in all the tones of fiery red, he could imagine. He walked to the back of the easel, and on the rear of the painting was its title. The Scarlet Woman. At the bottom left hand corner was a small sticker. It was presumably the artist's name. But it was no name he had ever heard of. It just said, V.O.V.O. He walked back around to the front of the painting, and stared at it once more. The hypnotizing effect took hold of him again, and a fire slowly arose in his loins. The feeling he had towards this woman was not one of love, but one of total lust. But he was not sure if those feelings were inseparable to him, at this time. His heart pounded and the moment took him. He pulled down his trousers, stared at the painting, 
and participated in the act of self-pleasure. She dyes her dark hair red She is water Disguised as fire He tells me, just as he was reaching climax, he opened his eyes to have a final glimpse of this, scarlet woman, before ejaculating. To his astonishment the painting had come alive, and the woman in it stared back at him. She then spoke, saying. What in earth do you think you're doing? Embarrassed he swiftly pulled his trousers back up and put himself away. But the woman in the painting reached out, and pulled him into it. Now. He stood at the top of a staircase, in a house, with a scarlet woman in front of him, as real as day. He told her he was really sorry that she had to see that, that he meant no disrespect, but the moment had just taken him. But the scarlet woman told him no apologies were necessary. That she was used to that sort of behavior from men. He recounted that she then turned and walked off without another word, disappearing into a room and leaving him standing at the top of the stairs. He stood confused for a while wondering what was going on, before walking into the room at the top of the stairs to try and find her. The room was vast with many doors along its walls and corners. Hello, he says he shouted, are you in here? No reply came, so he rounded a few corners before seeing her exit through a far away door. He chased after her, shouting out, but she didn't turn around. By the time he got to the door, he saw it led to an empty hallway, with many more doors lining it. For hours he searched these empty rooms, leading to more empty rooms. Sometimes he would catch a glimpse of the scarlet woman, just exiting through a door, but by the time he got there, she was nowhere to be found. He tells me that his heart was growing heavy, from this game of cat and mouse. That every time he caught a glimpse of her, he fell a little bit more in love with her. Even though it was only the backside of her he ever saw. He says within some of these empty rooms, he found the decaying corpses of men. Who seemingly, had tried to do, what he, was doing. Oh, I walked many, miles for her. Oh, with blistered feet, without a care. Do you, you didn't want me. Until I didn't want you Oh, oh I had the food 
you made Oh, until you try to poison me Cause you, you didn't want me Until I didn't want you And the way I never had. And I loved you for hurting me. And then my love made you feel sad. So sad that eventually Your love for me did burn But by that time I had seen behind the mirror a well-known story so sad but true to love a scarlet woman is a illusion He says, it could have been weeks or months. But one day after seeking her out, he caught a glimpse of her about to exit through a door, at the far end of a room. He collapsed to his knees and shouted out. Wait. I love you. With this, she froze in her tracks. For the first time in who knows how long, she didn't escape his sight. Gathering himself he ran over, to finally get to see her face again, and profess his love for her. He tells me that as he came up behind her, she slowly turned around. His heart grew with passion, from finally being able to look at this entrancing woman again, and make her, his. But when she turned around she was no longer a beautiful woman. Instead, an old crone looked back at him. You love me? She asked, her false teeth falling out in the process. He backed up, as her wrinkled arms reached out for him. Her once vibrant red hair now scraggly, gray and falling out, with every slightest movement. With every step backwards he made, she made one forwards. She started to undress herself, exposing her shriveled skeletal frame, her skin covered with weeping sores. He screamed and ran. Navigating rooms and hallways, attempting to find his way out, of this seemingly never-ending house. Her haunting voice behind him shouted. Why are you running away? If you love me. Finally, he found himself back on the stairs, where he had first arrived through the painting. There to his right was the painting itself, now displaying a picture of the field, from which he had been pulled in from. Just as she came through the door at the top of the stairs, he jumped back through the painting. Her gnarled fingers just glancing his feet. The echo of her cries slowly vanishing. He tells me, he now found himself lying in the green field, once again. Blue skies overhead. Birds singing in trees from the periphery of the forest. Looking back to the painting, it was no longer of the beautiful woman painted in fiery reds, but that of the old crone, painted in greys, with a full moon behind her. Lying face down on the grass, he breathed in the morning air. It tasted like freedom. 
Then a voice from behind him asked. Are you okay? He turned to see a lady standing there, holding bags of vegetables. She said. It looks like you've hurt yourself. Looking down at his body, he saw it was covered in cuts and bruises. He thinks he must have got them while trying to escape the house. Banging into corners, door frames and handles. The lady tells him that she is a doctor and that her house is not far from here. She seems trustworthy, so when she invites him back so that she can fix him up, he agrees. She tells him people call her Aunt Judith. That her niece lives with her, also a Judith, but known as Little Judy. When they arrive at her house, he notices that she grows all her own vegetables. But they only seem to be tomatoes and cucumbers. Going inside she puts him up on a table and calls in Little Judy, to help cleanse the wounds. He says that he noticed Little Judy do most of the work, while Aunt Judith, whispered instructions into her ear. They give him a healing elixir, made from the tomatoes and cucumbers, that would help him heal. But warned, it would make him drowsy. Drinking it down, he says, he almost instantly fell into a deep sleep. He doesn't know how long he was out, but he says he remembered a dream he had. In it, he had seen Aunt Judith and the Scarlet Woman, from the painting, talking. They were dressed in Victorian fashion. He thought that they must know each other. Then he noticed they were both holding guns behind their backs. In the dream, they both turned to look at him. Just then, he woke up. The room was dark, lit by candles. But a sliver of light could be seen beneath a door. As woozy as he was, he tried to focus in on the sounds coming from behind it. It was that of whispering. He says he listened as intently as he could. It sounded like Aunt Judith was whispering instructions, to little Judy. Who was then repeating them in a robotic manner, out loud. The last thing he heard was little Judy, repeating the words. Then kill him. Panic struck, as he realized, he had been tricked. He surveyed the dark room, the flickering light of the candles allowed him to see the apparatus that lined the walls. Aunt Judith was indeed a doctor, but she had forgotten to mention, what kind. It seemed like Aunt Judith, was a, witch doctor. It seemed like she was training little Judy to be one too, and he, was her next assessment. He heard the door handle turn and light filled the room. He says he used all his strength to push himself off the table and make a dash for the door. A horrifying screech echoed around him, that seemed to shake the entire house. Such a loud voice, for a little girl. Little Judy ran towards him in a demonic rage, wielding a kitchen knife above her head. Fumbling at the handle, he just got it open as little Judy attempted to stab his back. Luckily, only cutting his shirt, as he darted out the door. He says, as he ran over the vegetable patches, the tomatoes and cucumbers exploded like many landmines beneath his feet, covering him in their juices. When he got far enough away, he turned to see if little Judy was still chasing him. But he says they were both, just standing in the doorway, staring at him in the distance. And Judith's arm around little Judy's shoulders. The door slowly closing. The dark night. The full moon in the sky. He turned and ran back into the forest. Only stopping when he had no more breath in his body. Collapsing onto the cold forest floor, he replayed the events that had just happened. Imagining what he would have done, had he been strong enough, and not caught unaware. Then. He passed out. them in the face if I had the strength to attack. Maybe I'd tie them down and have my wicked way. Take their head with a kitchen knife and put it on display. The darkness will consume you if you don't give it a place to bloom. And one day you could become I'll cut that cunt Who whispered all those words When all that I could do Was try to feel not worse Does friendship not mean nothing 
to no one anymore That gift of peace rejected For an everlasting war Your words, they will consume you When you speak without a clue And one day when they return you'll be In the depths of his sleep, he says a dream emerged. He was inside a star, that was made of glass. It spun, at a furious rate around him. Creating a donut-shaped field of energy, that stretched far and wide. All of a sudden, it shattered, and he found himself, floating in outer space. His body swaying, from some unseen force. As he slowly awakened from the dream, he tells me his body was in fact, swaying back and forth. It took him a while to realize it but he was lying at the shoreline of a beach. The incoming and outgoing waves, gently moving him. As he recounts it, it must have been very early morning, as the sun was just about to peak over the horizon. He says he felt extreme comfort in this moment, a comfort he had never felt before. Saying, it was like a blanket of peacefulness had been placed upon him. Making the most of it, he lay there until the sun came up, not wanting the moment to end. Eventually he got to his feet and took in his surroundings, he was at Opal Bay, where, the seer lives. The last place he had been, before entering the forest, and experiencing everything he had been through. He knew not what day, date or year it could be. Time, had again changed. And, he was totally fine with that. On the shores of Opal Bay As he recounts it, he walked from the beach to sit on a bench beside a small river. Before his eyes an apparition appeared. It was five ladies holding hands, dancing in a circle. He looked at them one by one and recognized them. There, was the Dark Mother, whom he had met in the hut. Beside her there was the Scarlet Woman. 
whose house he had escaped from. Beside her was Aunt Judith and little Judy. Closest to him was the seer. He says that, the seer opened her hand to break the circle, and waved for him to come to her. Tears rolled down his cheeks, as he looked upon the smiles on all these ladies' faces. He realized they had all been for his benefit. They weren't trying to harm him. They were only trying to help him. To help him, save himself. He says that he rose from the bench, and walked toward the apparition, that was now real. As he did, he slowly decreased in age, with each step. Passing into the circle, the ladies joined hands again, and danced around him. He looked down at himself and saw he was a child again. Laughing with joy, he danced amongst all these ladies, who had helped him return to innocence. He looked to the seer, his faithful teacher, and she said to him, We. Are. Earth. We are the mother. In all her elemental aspects, separated for you to understand. But now we are whole again. We are the feminine that lives in not only females, but in males too, and also in those who choose not to recognize outdated gender normalities. The last thing he heard the seer say was, Now, go and meet the father. As the ladies danced around him in a circle in one direction, he danced amongst them, in a circle, in the other direction. A golden energy built up around them, and he noticed his body was inside the same glass star he had been before, when he was dreaming. It spun faster and faster around him. Then in a flash of brilliant light, everything disappeared. Now, he says, he looked down at his hands. They were covered in tattoos. His body was big again. He was the same age he had been before. He was sitting in his living room. He had no idea how he got back here. He took in the stillness of it all. Life seemed new again. He heard cars passing from the road outside. It seemed normal. A new normal. A nice, new normal. Having abstained from alcohol from the start of his journey, he says, that now he felt like he should drink again, to celebrate. And there was only one drink worthy of a celebration this large. The monk's finest. The blood of Christ. The holy, buck-fast tonic wine. So, for the first time in a long time he visited the off-license and got a few bottles of Bucky. Getting back home he hooked up his projector, having sold his TV years back, to his laptop and amplifier. And blasted all his favorite tunes while getting steaming, and dancing like a madman. He sets the scene for me. Telling me that, the projector filled the wall behind which I was sat, to which he points, I turn and see it is now covered in the strange symbolic writing he calls, the language of the underworld. He says it was once plain white, and measures 7 feet by 10 feet. It was here he danced, and sang along to all the songs he had ever loved. Soon enough, exhaustion set in, and he collapsed to the floor, in a drunken giggling heap. Lying with his eyes closed, his inner world swayed in morphing colors behind his eyes, his heart beat like it was going to explode in his chest. But he says it felt good. It felt like he was alive again. He says he doesn't know how long he lay there, but it was long enough for YouTube to stop playing and ask him if he was still watching. By now, the room was totally silent. Opening his eyes, he said that a still image was projected on the wall. It was of a group of men sat around a square table, with their backs to him. He says he didn't recognize this video, and when he tried to press play on his laptop, nothing happened. Confused, he tells me he walked right up to the projected image on the wall, to get a better look. Suddenly the men all turned around at once to look at him. Shocked, he stumbled back. He then says the image blazed with a light, that engulfed the room. And then, an unknown energetic blast, pulled him into it. Now. He found himself standing in the middle of the square table, with the men seated around him. From this perspective, of being inside the video, he could make out who the men were. There, was Lemmy from Motorhead, smoking a cigarette and drinking whiskey. There, was Cliff Burton from Metallica, dressed in a cut-off t-shirt, misfits tattoo on his upper arm, wearing flared jeans. There, was Gigi Allen, naked and covered in his own blood and excrement. There, was Chuck Schuldner from Death, practicing scales on his guitar and in the process of inventing death metal. There, was Lux Interior from The Cramps, dressed in a PVC catsuit. 
These, were the men who had inspired him, musically, at different points in his life. These, were his dead idols. These, were the father. Counts that Lemmy brought him to an adjoining room. It was called the Crossroads. Lemmy told him that this room contained the records of ancestral rebels. It was a portal where he could travel to other lives he was living in different timelines. He was told that he was the keeper of these records, that he was to maintain them and add to them as he traveled and discovered. Holographic images of these records floated in the air around him. He was prompted to press one named, Nevaya. This was known as the fourth dimension. When he did, another ten images appeared. Which he was told, were versions of himself, that lived in this fourth dimensional timeline. Perusing them he took in the names. Boy Destroyer. Rhea Monday. King Rat. Animals of Love. Doom Jones. Little Voice. E.R. Melchizedek Rainbow Eye Jaju Zell Merman Lemmy prompted him to press one and hear what he sounded like in that timeline. He pressed on an image which contains a floating banana. His name in this timeline was, Doom Jones. We are the birds, we are the flowers. We are the trees, we are the stars. We are the bones, we are the flesh. We are the web, we are the nest. We are everything you think. We are everything. We are everything you think. is told that Doom Jones is a Christ-like figure, about 200 years beyond the time, that the third dimensional version of him, was living, that he speaks his gospel through his music, which is simple and childlike, he is told that unfortunately, Doom Jones, was killed shortly after releasing his first EP, but that his message inspired a revolt, in the disenfranchised youth, of that time, leading to a massive shift in the timeline, for the better, he presses another. This one is named Ja Juzel.
tells him that in this timeline he is a troll, who lives in a forest. The closest thing the music he creates here, would be what people call, black metal. But in the timeline that Ja Juzel exists in, it is comparable to what he would know as classical music. He presses one more. This one is called Little Voice. Lemmy tells him that, Little Voice, is a head hunter, who makes music that is played while his tribe slaughter their enemies. He is told that Little Voice is living around the timeline of what he would know as the fall of Atlantis. Lemmy tells him, these people had technology comparable to what, his would be, by the middle of the century he was currently living. But that they lived a more nomadic, tribal lifestyle. A door sat to his left. He says that he was told, that on the other side of that door was, Navaya. Also called, the fourth density of reality. He was told that he now had two options. He could return to the world he had just come from, and find himself laying on his living room floor, just like he had been, before he came here. Or he could walk through the door that led to Navaya, where he would have the job of documenting his experience there, for the next seven years. He says, he questioned, would people not wonder where he had disappeared to? If he chose to live in Navaya for seven years? But he was told, seven years in Navaya, is comparable to a year in Earth time. While ruminating about the decision, he was then told, that an awful plague was about to sweep over Earth. Killing many people in its wake, and changing the future direction of the world. For the better. He was told that people, would be so caught up in the upheaval of their lives, they wouldn't even know he was missing. This plague would be known as the Flood. He decided he would rather not live through a plague on Earth, and chose to go through the door, that led to Navaya. In his choosing he was told that in Navaya, he was known by many names. But for this job, most people referred to him as Sebastian X. And that this, would be his main name while he documented his experience there. He was told he would write seven books. One for each year he would spend here. Individually they would be entitled. The Lamp. A book of poetry. The Fire. A book of short stories. The Sun. A novel. The Book. A book of art. The Poet. A book of poetry. The Man. A book of investigative journalism. The Fool. A book of poetry. Collectively they would be known as, the seven emanations from the fourth density of reality. Walking down the corridor, towards the door, Lemmy said to him. Though I should tell you, Earth will not be the same place it was, when you left it. And so here, he says he opened the door to Navaya, and walked into a new world. He tells me that the experience was so vast, time and space does not allow it to be included in this story. But that he's sure it will turn up somewhere. He did tell me though, that while there, he experienced himself in many forms, in many moments of existence. On the final day, seven years later, he typed the last sentence of his seventh book. Having documented his experience, in the strange and wonderful place known as Navaya. He tells me he closed down his laptop and rested back in his seat. Explaining that Navaya is much like Earth, but without the rational restrictions Earth has placed upon it. He says that anything is possible in Navaya. That one's own thoughts create their experience of it. This is why only certain people who have learned how to control their minds, are permitted access to it. For those who haven't, would create chaos. Continuing with the story, he tells me a handful of photos he had taken, while there, littered the coffee table, on which he had just sat his laptop. These were pictures of friends he had met while living in Navaya. He says that he picked them up, and reminisced about all the good times and adventures they had experienced together. 
staring into a photo of two of his best Navian friends, he tells me that an intense pink and golden light started to emanate from their eyes. It got so big, it filled him, and the entire room in which he was sat. It was at this point that he knew he was going home. So he closed his eyes, relaxed, and took a deep breath. Ready for a better one.